I'm not Brother Mike, <clears throat> but I do have something to speak on his topic for a few minutes. Um, his text is 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, and it says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. And the part that he's going to be really speaking on is the last part where it says, Let all things be done unto edifying. And I like how this is the first topic of the table, since it is the topic of every joint supplying, how as every joint supplies, have it be done unto edifying. And we can see how every joint is supplying, but even the text itself, how they bring a psalm, a doctrine, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation. But all of this is done for the purpose of edifying the brethren. The joints and bands sustain and give what's needful to the other members of the body. Um, if this is done for the purpose of edifying, then great help is ministered to the saints because of the intent for building them up and increasing them in the body of Christ. If what is presented is purpose for, um, to be for their strengthening and their advancement, then the body of Christ would profit it with the things that are brought to them and spoken to them. If edifying is not in mind when these things are done, then what is done is not spoken and profitable to the saints. There may even be an obstacle placed in the way because of how it was spoken or what was presented because it was not for the purpose of building up the saints of God, but to speak or to present something. Um, the context of this text is also in speaking, how it speaks about, to the Corinthians about just speaking and how all these things were done that were spoken. And I was considering how edification occurs when what is spoken is understood and causes for the saints to be increased in their faith, increased in their love for the Lord, and increased in their likeness of him. Paul made a good argument about doing all these things in a manner that would result in edification of the body. And in a sense, you can say that the purpose of speaking is to edify one another. The purpose is not just to hear yourself talk or to say something, because it's not a profit to anyone if you do that, yourself or the others who are listening. I also considered how the text said, all things, how everything that is spoken is unto edification. And that includes reproof or correction or exhortation or other means of communicating with the saints. How at the time they may not be seen for edifying, but if it's for the purpose of building them up and for the purpose of increasing their faith, then it is for the purpose of edifying the brethren for those things to be done. Um, if it's for the advancement of a brother or sister or for the benefit of the saints, then it is um, edifying and edification is happening. Um, I was also considering, well, I'll stop there. So as we begin our table and our feasting on the things that the Lord has prepared for us um, during this time of fellowship, whatever we are bringing or supplying and hoping to supply for the to the body, do it with the intent to edify and with the intent to encourage, because then it will bring the most benefit to the saints. And then I'll let Brother Michael finish expounding the text. Good evening, brethren. <clears throat> Glad to be together for this special meeting, which we call the Table in the Wilderness. <clears throat> it's another time of concentrated uh, blessing from the Lord, another time of concentrated edifying of one another. <clears throat> I want to begin with a few words about just the, the theme, that which every joint supplies. Wherever there is a joint, or you could also say a ligament, it's, that's, it's not talking about like bone joints necessarily, but where you're joined together, the thing that joins us, <clears throat> like ligaments. <clears throat> Whenever there is these joints that connects us to Jesus, there is to be edification supplied to and through that joint. <clears throat> so what is, what is it that's supplied through the joints? Edification. <clears throat> we are edified by means of our connection with the other members of the body. It's, and it's through the connection is the point. If there's no connection, then you don't get what Jesus has. That's just that's the way He's made it. If you don't, if you're not connected to a, some part of His body by some means, then you don't get what Jesus has. That's that's just the plain truth of it. <clears throat> Those connections are the joints through which our supply comes. So we're not speaking about carnal connections here, like family or coworkers or neighbors or acquaintances that you might meet or old friends from school or whatever. This is a connection that God has made. When he put us in Christ, that's, that's how this connection was first made. 
And in this, we're joined together with Christ. It's not just each other, it's with Christ. <clears throat> so this isn't like taking the name and the phone number of someone that you meet in the grocery store. <clears throat> it's a connection made with those who have all their names written in heaven, in the Lamb's book of life. If there's no connection with the head, then whatever connection it may be is only temporal. A church in which people have some kind of connection, but they're not being edified, is nothing more than a religious club that will pass away when the world passes away. Eternal life cannot be sustained in the people of God while in this world without edification. Advancement cannot be made without edification. Therefore, to the churches, the Holy Spirit says, let all things be done unto edifying. That is at least one of the main purposes for our connection to each other in this world. I also wanted to share some thoughts about the differing ministries. <clears throat> one interesting thing about the differing functions in the body of Christ is that every different function appeals to all of the members. <clears throat> because every function or part is representative of Christ himself. And that's our desire, to be more like Christ. In our hearts, we want to be as effective as every other part. For example, if we may not be the main person, or I'll, I'll use myself, I, I may not be the main person you think of when you think of merciful, <clears throat> yet I desire to be merciful as the person you thought of. Because I, I see that in that person. I see that's like Christ. And that per see the Lord put that person connection with me so I could see Amen. his or her mercifulness and strive to be like them in that. Yes. <clears throat> so if we're not, again, for another example, if we are not the primary exhorter, yet we desire to still to be good exhorters. And you could use many other different examples. Each of us is an example to each of us. We not only provide our particular ministry to help others, but we also set the example in that particular thing because the other parts want to do that too. When a brother or sister goes through a trial of suffering and comes out unscathed on the other side of it, we, we don't all express our joy because it wasn't us. <clears throat> As if to say that member specializes in suffering, but that's not my ministry. You know, we don't say that. Rather, we take note of their faith and of their perseverance and mark that person as the example to follow. Not only did observing their strength through the trial bless us, but we were taught by it, we were exhorted by it, the report of it, and we were equipped by their example for the time when we must go through our trials. In this way, we are edified by our brother's or sister's perseverance not only through the trial, but long after it was over. And because of the joints between us, we were able to minister comfort and strength to that brother or sister during the trial. We feed them and they feed us. Mm -hmm. Through the joints that bind us together, we grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. <clears throat> Growing up is required not only for living in this world now, but for what is up ahead. In the ages to come, growing up is required. That's required now. That's before you get there. You're required to grow up. That's what this is all about. <clears throat> then there's a principle that works through all joints, again referring to either our, our natural bodies or the body of Christ. There's a principle that works through all the joints for good or for bad. Diseases spread through the body too and can spread to other people through contact uncrucified flesh boils over into all kinds of sin. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, etc., etc. You know the list there from Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> A person who has not or cannot crucify the flesh is going to be our partaker in many kinds of sins. No sinner can honestly say, my work of the flesh is envying, but that's the only sin I commit. Not any of those other things in that list. I don't have any problems with adultery or fornication or lasciviousness. I have no idols and witchcraft doesn't appeal to me. <clears throat> I'm never hateful or argumentative. I never get angry. I don't drink alcohol or take drugs. My only sin is just envying. It just doesn't work that way. 
We know that if the flesh is not crucified, it breaks out in all kinds of sin, and it grows worse and worse. That's the nature of the flesh. There's no such thing as a one-sin sinner. <clears throat> now, the, the, taking that same principle, the opposite is true of those who are born again and born of God. <clears throat> None of us have only one gift that Christ gave to us. Everything that we are in Christ is shared with everyone else in Christ. Each of us has a well that springs up from within us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. None of us can say, I only have the fruit of gentleness, but not any of these other things. <clears throat> Salvation makes us like Christ and like God, and that is where we get the fruit of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> these are all godly traits that we were born again with. <clears throat> and that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. All kinds of good things spring out of righteousness and true holiness. This is the body that God has placed us in, one that benefits every part connected to the head. Are there limits to righteousness and true holiness? Can we have the goodness of God, but not the faith? Can we specialize in long-suffering, but have no meekness and no long-suffering or, or long, no temperance? The point is that even though each of us might be stronger in one thing or another, that does not mean that we completely lack all of the other things. <clears throat> this is where being members of a body has a great advantage. <clears throat> Our strengths and particular gifts help the others, and the strengths and particular gifts of the others help us. This is how we're, we're being filled up now. <clears throat> what happens in the body is that each joint is a supply line, and the supply yeah. goes through the joints in both directions. <clears throat> each one of us is giving and receiving through the joints, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. As we're connected to the head, we get all kinds of good things from each other. Amen. Now the context in which uh, <clears throat> my main verse is found 1 Corinthians 14, 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. The context in which we find this exhortation, do all unto edifying, <clears throat> is the often referred to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Some might call the, the tongues chapter, speaking in tongues. Paul has more to say about speaking in tongues in 1 Corinthians 14 than any other place in the Bible. <clears throat> and since Paul is speaking about edification in the assembly within the context of speaking in tongues, one might assume that speaking in tongues is a very edifying thing to do in the assembly of the saints. However, that would be a very wrong conclusion according to what Paul says here. That's not what Paul's teaching. Ever since I was a young boy, I've been amazed how certain people will go to 1 Corinthians 14 to uh, bolster their alleged speaking in tongues and the kind of things that they do in the assembly. But actually, if we'll read this carefully, Paul is actually rebuking the Corinthians for this, Amen. not encouraging them in it. <clears throat> certain Christian sects are quick to remind us that Paul spoke in tongues. <clears throat> But they have not carefully examined what Paul said here, verse 18 and 19. Paul says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all, yet in the church. Let me try that again. I speak in tongues more than you all, yet in the church. Yeah. Sounds to me like he's saying, I don't speak in tongues in the church. Let me finish the verse. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Yeah. Apparently, Paul did not speak in tongues in the church. Apparently, he had no interest in having some kind of personal spiritual experience that was for him only in the assembly. <clears throat> 
He had no interest in bringing attention to himself in the assembly except to give what share what God had given him. Amen. If a person reads 1 Corinthians carefully and with understanding, they'll find that the theme of the chapter is not speaking in tongues, but edification. <clears throat> not only what is said should be edifying, but everything that is done, especially in the assembly. And not only what is done, but how it is done. Again, Paul says, Psalms, doctrine, tongues, revelation, interpretation. He said, all of you have this. You come together. You all have this, but you're not edifying one another. So how are you using what God has given you? Not when you use it all at once and in a spirit of competition, like at Corinth. That's not edifying. <clears throat> that means it's possible, then, to perform all five acts of worship and still not edify anyone. <clears throat> Edification is the rule, not personal experience when we come together, not personal preference, not appealing to the lost, not when we come together. And if edification is the rule, then it also means that we can do anything in the assembly that results in edification. Now, I know not everyone can handle a statement like this, but if it can be done unto edification, do it. And if, if it's not unto edification, don't do it. This is a verse, my main text is a verse that gets very little attention, if any, in Babylonian churches. <clears throat> Edification, as we all know, is not uh, uh, the main thing in mainstream churches. And if the word edify or edification is used at all, I doubt that people have the proper understanding of its meaning and importance. <clears throat> because the last thing the devil wants in Babylon is for people to be edified. <clears throat> But not only is edification one of the main things when we come together, but Paul uses the word all here. <clears throat> Let all things be done unto, unto edification. So only the preaching? No, all things. Only Bible class and preaching? No, all things. Amen. Only the things that we do that are on the schedule? No, do all unto edifying. <clears throat> only the men? Do all unto edifying. Only the adults do all things unto edifying, brethren. <clears throat> Let this be our great commission. Whenever the people of God come together, do all things unto edifying. <clears throat> That's 100%. There are a lot of ways to edify the brethren, and mainly it's going to be through something that you say. <clears throat> but let everything that is done fall under one single heading, edification. Now, why edify? <clears throat> why is this so important? <clears throat> if we can see the reason for edification, I think it will, we won't have to go to a dictionary to define it if you just see the reason for it. <clears throat> there are many different opinions among uh, modern churchgoers as to the purpose of the church. Some say it's a hospital for sick people. That's a famous one nowadays. Some say it's so, to be uh, in order to fulfill something called the Great Commission. Others say that the church is a community. Uh, it, it's to fill in for the community where the government kind of left some gaps because of budget cuts and whatnot. The government can't help everyone out. So some people say this is the church's role. You fill this in. This is what the church is for. No. <clears throat> not for homeless, feeding the poor. Not... We don't, if you want to do that, that's fine. I'm just saying that's not what the church is for. Not for organizing fundraisers and protests and against injustices in the land, and the list goes on and on. The church belongs to Jesus Christ and is a very big part of something that has nothing to do with this world, Amen. except that we are being saved from it Amen. and being conformed to the image of Christ in it. What God is doing through Jesus Christ is being worked out in this world, but it is not of this world or for this world. And any professed believer that is conformed to this world is not part of his church. We are being prepared for the world to come, in which the church, the bride of Christ, and the, will be the bride of Christ and the dwelling place of God. This text that uh, Brother Aaron read from Ephesians chapter 4 reveals this. This is why... Christ gave these gifts to the church. <clears throat> it fulfills a purpose here 
till we come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that you're not tossed to and fro while you're in this world. Amen. That's why God, that's why Christ gave us these gifts and gave us edification, <clears throat> speaking the truth in love so that we'll grow up, <clears throat> but it's also for the world to come. <clears throat> True edification makes for improvement and progress. It's not, edification is just not something that you experience. I, I, we come together to experience some edification. No, there's a, there's a point to it. It's, it's for improvement and progress. It's to go forward. <clears throat> it is God's design that most of the preparations we receive for the world to come are received through other members of the body, the church. <clears throat> Our commission is not to get together and have a good time. It's not to keep the wheels of the institution greased and turning. Yeah. Our commission is to help each other come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and that ye may grow up into him in all things. Amen. This is not accomplished through creeds or procedures or emotional experiences, but through connections with the body of Christ. <clears throat> all are connected to him who is the head, and all are connected to each other. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of, the, of water by the word, that he might present it to himself. A glorious church, not having spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. <clears throat> now, Jesus loved us so that he could get something, so that he could do this. That's what this is for. And so that his Father could get what he's preparing. The church does not exist to give everyone the warm fuzzies about themselves. It is God with whom we have to do. As it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all the deep things of God. <clears throat> what we inherited from Adam is nowhere good enough to fit in to what Christ is doing. Amen. No good thing dwells in our flesh. God's elect have to be saved and prepared in Christ for the glory that he has prepared for them that love him. If God's going to dwell with us and fill us with himself, then there must be some edification first. The saints have to be built up to endure through this world and to come out on the other side of the judgment without spot or blemish. So a great work has to be done. In this time, this brief vapor that we are here, a great work has to be done. Now, it's against this backdrop that we understand the word edify. <clears throat> Edification is the means to a determined end, and that end is glory. In between here and there, we must be given life from God, and we must grow up in it, and we must maintain it, while in a wicked world, in a hostile environment. We must be strong through trials and suffering. We must overcome the world and the flesh and the devil. How is this going to be done? Jesus puts us with other believers... And we edify one another. Yes, right. When we realize the nature of our warfare and the glory that's up ahead, we say in agreement with the Holy Spirit, let all things be done unto edifying. Yeah. Another reason for edification of the saints is that by this means we are learning to function as one unit, as a body does. Our individuality will not be lost in heaven. We'll know one another in heaven. Jesus is going to give us a new name, and we'll be known by him, by that name. So we're not, we're not, you're not going to lose your individuality in heaven, <clears throat> but it's not about individuality. What Jesus is building for the Father is not about individuality. It's about unity. <clears throat> for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. The early church was characterized by this, by one accord. We see this phrase in Scripture in Acts 2.1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And in chapter 4, verse 32, 
The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. God is too big to dispense of himself in just one person or even a small group of persons, not just a few redeemed people. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Amen. Usually cities aren't compact together. Usually they're, they get bigger and they spread out. But Jerusalem, it's a city. It's big, but it's compact together. It's fit together, custom fitted. <clears throat> New Jerusalem is made up of nations and kings that bring their glory into it. If God only needed a few and only wanted a few, then he would be saving only a few. <clears throat> But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. The next project that our God undertakes has not been revealed to us yet, but it involves the great throng of angels and the saved of the earth. Our assemblies in this world are teaching us how to function together as one body for one purpose, just as your own body does. Mm -hmm. We ought to strive to pray as one, to sing as one, to listen as one, to agree as one, yeah. and serve God as one. Yeah. We have an example of this concept, just one that I thought of, of the holy angels. <clears throat> now, they are innumerable. And they are all individuals. We don't know much about them. We know two of them that have names. <clears throat> and yet, according to the word of God, the ministry of the angels, this innumerable company, can summed up, be summed up in a single purpose. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Are they not all ministering spirits, spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So here they're single in their purpose. <clears throat> if an innumerable company can be categorized by a single ministry, then so can the people of God. And in fact, they are. Know ye not that ye, all of you, are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? This is, this is true now, but this is what we're also preparing for in the world to come in a fuller Amen. sense. <clears throat> and the work that is being done is described in the epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. And that's not just here. And of the household of God. Now there's the many individuals. <clears throat> there's many. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building. One building. All those persons. One building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, Amen. in whom ye also are builded together for an, an habitation of God through the Spirit. So edification is not just an experience that we all want to have when we come together. Edification has a purpose and a designed end. <coughs> Excuse me which is that we will all fit together properly and gloriously as the habitation of God. <clears throat> In closing, I want to consider these words, do all, do all unto edifying. Yes. Be aware of what is needed and give what you have. <clears throat> you see the need because you have what's needed. <clears throat> yes. Sometimes it's a matter of timing. Today, you may see a need, you may be, supply, be able to supply it, and a week from now, someone else may have to supply you with that very same thing. That's just the way it works. What I'm trying to, to get at here is we, you can't put all this in a tidy little box where I've got my gift, this one gift, this is mine, none of you have it, and I, I specialize in this gift all the time. I, I never have need of my gift. I've got it all. It just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. Yeah. For I know the forwardness of your mind. Here's another example from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> I know the forwardness of your mind for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Paul's talking about helping saints that are in need in Jerusalem. 
And the Corinthian zeal provoked very many, not because the other churches were stingy, that's not why, not because they were negligent, <clears throat> but because they, they rose to the top in this matter. They set the example. <clears throat> the proof that the other churches were willing to help the saints is seen in that they were provoked to do something about it, and they did. <clears throat> if they were not willing, Corinth's example would not have provoked them. So they were willing, they, they had they had the, the mind of Christ, the spirit of the Lord in this thing. They wanted to do it. <clears throat> but the, the Corinthians led the way, doing what Christ had given them to see, and their moving to action caused others to do the same. <clears throat> and this, this was ministered through the joints in the body. Amen. Also in this record, we see that we are not only talking about individuals helping in, individuals. We're going to break down that barrier too. <clears throat> That limitation, I should say. Here, one church, through the joints of the body, supplied the impetus to many other churches. <clears throat> Their zeal to minister to believers spilled over to other churches to minister to believers. <clears throat> Consider also that what we supply does not have to be classified as a gift. It doesn't have to be something that no one else has. And it doesn't have to be something that you have always and in abundance. What we are talking about here is to use whatever you have, use everything you have <clears throat> that God has given you to benefit the saints. Not only the special things that perhaps no one else has, but give every good thing that you can possibly minister to the people of God. Amen. Where did that good thing come from? Yeah. Did it come from you? For, did it come from Adam? If it came from Christ... No matter what it is, share it with the saints. Amen. Everyone has something to supply, and everyone has need of being supplied. So, brethren, I exhort you to do all things unto edifying. Amen. Amen.